Dr. Groves actually is a practitioner in central Missouri. He's a University of Missouri grad. He went into mixed practice actually with his father um, a while ago and, and over time has transitioned to an entirely cattle practice. Um, he serves cow calf and stalker clients. Some of, uh, some of his stalker clients are pretty large in central Missouri and, and some other parts of the southeast. And he's going to talk to us today about <clears throat> using biocontainment as a way to manage health and high-risk calves. He's going to think about this or, or explain this to us from a, a systems level approach. Thank you um, to the extension and to Brian for asking me to uh, to to speak. Uh, I have uh, a little bit of a connection to to University of Nebraska in. In that, I I'm, uh, was lucky enough to attend one of the beef cattle production management series uh, just just after the, I think, 04 I took it. So um, Brian asked me to talk a little bit today about some of my perspectives about biocontainment. And I guess I'll... I'll um, I'll preface that by saying that I live in a, in a little bit different world than you guys. Um, I just need to check one deal here, make sure. Okay. Um, Brian, I didn't get any confirmation that you were hearing me. Are you guys hearing me all right? Yep. You're coming through well. Okay. Very good. Um, so I live in, in central Missouri. Um, I've practiced for about 28 years now, and, and most of my professional has, effort has been in the, in the stalker industry, that is hot, handling um, what, what would be considered high-risk calves. So the world in which I practice um, for a long time we thought was kind of a a mini version of feed yard medicine. And really I had to practice a long time to get a different perspective. So as I developed that different perspective, um, I kind of developed some, some, some theories and ways to teach people of how I thought it was different. And um, so I will kind of go through some biocontainment strategies that we do in the stalker industry that I think, I think can apply to, um, feedlots and certainly producers in Nebraska I know handle um, plenty of high-risk cattle so hopefully this will resonate so this is this is very much a, um, a personal issue to me um, I've uh, practiced in the town I grew up in um, my my clients are my friends and my neighbors and um, so this, this is more than just a professional activity. Uh, you know, my, my approach to my profession is, is very personal. So uh, I think Brian did a nice job introducing me, so I won't go too much farther. But um, so, so most, most of my practice is made up of kind of hot, uh, large kind of complex stalker operators that are opportunity buyers. And they buy in all days except Sunday, and they buy in all weight classes. Um, overall business plan is to add value to the cattle by increasing their health status and assembling them into lots that are um, attractive to feed yards. Um, and those feed yards kind of are sometimes large private yards, sometimes they're large corporate yards. That kind of changes over time. But the reason I threw up this up there is that I think some people think that stockers and backgrounders are just are opportunity buyers and don't understand the complexity of their business model. So we essentially buy cattle um, from a lot of sources, assess their risk, and um, they enter a production model where we actually try to have um, pretty good assessment of what the risk at each stage 
uh, of our production cycle. And we, and we try to manage these cattle the best way we can through, through a pretty complex uh, system that, that um, receives them, starts them, grows them, and markets them, and sometimes changes location several times. So I'm also uh, lucky to be a member uh, of, a, of a kind of a fledgling organization that, that I've been accused many times of not thinking right or thinking differently. But there's a group of us who are, who are trying to improve our skills on systems thinking. And although some people think I've been a little bit natural, belonging to a group that tries to promote systems thinking in the veterinary profession, and not just the veterinary profession, but anybody that... Um, that are part of our extended system. Um, we think uh, systems thinking is a way for us to, to address complex problems. And so I will tell you that I spend a lot of time driving around and really most of my time <laughs> is, is spent admiring the iceberg that is BRD and high risk calves. And, admiring the iceberg is a little phrase used in systems thinking. That means I'm thinking deeply about a very complex problem and complex problems like iceberg only have a, has a small percentage of, of that iceberg showing. And there's a lot um, that is out of view that needs to be thought about. So, so I think a lot about that. And one of the ways I think deeply about it is I try to figure out the anomalies. So I try to figure out the things that I can't explain with my current view of the world. So, and I have some examples of that I'll talk you through, but I, I've always struggled to understand that with kit, with calves that would be would have what we would consider identical health risk, how, why they perform radically in different ways when they enter different production systems. And one of the first places I saw that is my work in, in markets. And, um, you know, Missouri has a lot of markets and a lot of high risk cattle. And that's where a lot of my work is done and markets, at least in my part of the world, are dominated by order buyers. Order buyers are filling orders of high-risk calves for, for pretty sophisticated operations. And actually, for my clients, we use order buyers. And then I'd walk into the sale ring, and I'd see one of my good cow-calf clients sitting in the ring um, buying calves. And I would, uh, I would see him buy calves that I knew were stale, were, I knew were compromised, I knew that we're at the bar, barn last week, and I'd, I'd worry, I'd go, I'd go talk to him, I'd say, you know, uh, you, you know, those, those calves are going to be pretty challenging, are you sure you're, you're set up to have them? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've raised cattle most of my life, I can handle them, and in, invariably, I'd have these experienced older farmers buy calves, and actually never even come to my office for a sophisticated antibiotic. They actually got along real good with penicillin and, and oxytetracycline. So that was something I could never explain is, is, is how, come, how come they could take one group of calves home per year and get along fine with, with them. I could send identical calves to, to a, a stocker operation and need to use metaphylaxis and still doctor 50%. So that was an anomaly I was working on. The other one that you hear of, and I've actually experienced, is, is that when we have a problem with cattle getting to one of these big stocker operations, and they, they buy multiple loads a day, and we've had situations where trucks miss corners in the middle of the night, and trucks turn over, and they have to turn the calves loose in the brush. So we had a situation one time when we bought three loads of calves. One of the trucks didn't make it. It got close, it got within about 10 miles of us and it missed a corner. And we had to turn those calves out, out into, the, into the neighbor's fields. The, the other two, 
I made it to the yard and of course made it to me as their veterinarian and they entered our production chain. The, the anomaly I couldn't figure out is why after we gathered all those calves up and it took about 45 days to gather them up and the owners didn't have any problems pointing this out to me, why did those calves that actually been through a truck wreck and were living on the neighbors in the neighbor's brush for the past 45 days, why did they have better health, health outcomes than the ones I had actually vaccinated into our system? So when you think deeply, sometimes it's helpful to think about the anomalies. And <clears throat> the other thing I think about are things that humble me. Um, war, wars that I think I'm losing. So it worries me that this, despite having exponentially more knowledge regarding immunology and microbiology and antibiotics, exponentially more than when I graduated in 92, that I think fundamentally we're losing, we're losing the battle with, with BRD, at least in, in the world I live in, um, with high-risk cattle. Um, seems our production systems are are increasing their use of antibiotics over time to where I think <clears throat> most would admit that it's standard operating procedure in the stocker business um, for metaphylaxis. It, it's, it's rare, it does occur that, that people can get along without metaphylaxis, but so, so I think deeply about why that is. And I, there, there won't be a lot of notes to take during this presentation. I hope you find it a little bit entertaining, but I, I, I want you to may, maybe ask you to focus a little bit differently than you have in the past and maybe consider that perhaps there's leverage in not just understanding the risk that's inherent to the calf, right? So that's, we, we spend a lot of time studying that risk. That's how far we hauled them, that's how they were vaccinated, that's cortisol levels and vaccines and antibiotics. And that's all the stuff we learned <clears throat> in vet school and have been focusing on. But I want you to perhaps think that maybe to consider that we might have some risk that's inherent just to the system, just, just to how we built beef production system in the United States. And to be honest, I, I really hope by the end of the presentation, you're willing to cross out that perhaps. And I hope you, you, see, you see the world that a little bit like I do, and that you're willing to admit that there, there is truly a ton of leverage in understanding the risk that's inherent to the system, not just the gap. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So first, we're just gonna review real quick about some things we know about the disease dynamics. And it may be, I know this group is made up not just of veterinarians, but of other people, but I think we've all had a good lesson in disease dynamics um, with the pandemic, pandemic we're um, experiencing. And, you know, there's really some good information that, that's shared in the media. A little bit of it's confusing, but I want to review a little bit about how, how disease moves through populate, populations. But I want to do it for you in a way that you probably haven't before. I, I don't want to do it with line graphs, but I, I want to do it visually because this is actually a way that kind of helps me uh, communicate with clients. You know, some people are visual learners and these are a lot more impactful lessons if you if if we can if we can view it. So so I'll I'll ask you to have a little bit of imagination because it's going to take a little bit of thinking to and focus to kind of follow what I'm doing here, but hopefully it'll make sense. And uh, to aid you in your ability to visually look at disease dynamics, I'm gonna equip you with some magic glasses. So these glasses will actually allow you to see the disease status of an animal. Now that might not make sense now, but it will, it will in a minute. So, and 
what we're going to use as an example is we're going to use a pen of 100 calves. And we're going to use um, some systems modeling called agent-based modeling. So this, this, a colleague, Dr. Faulkner, and I did in a program called NetLogo, which is actually a very easy program to learn and manipulate and run. So the, these agent-based modeling software allows us to model how viruses or other agents move through populations. And if you think about it, uh, a lot of disease and a lot of systems really have to do with probability. So it allows you to man manipulate a lot of probabilities. Um, for instance, the probability of a calf being infected when you buy it. So uh, the probability that if a calf comes in contact with another calf, what's the probability he'll, he'll give his infection to the next calf? Um, what's, what's the probability that he'll recover after 96 hours? So actually what it is, is a piece of software that you can work with for a while and you can get it to nicely model how disease spreads through populations. So, um, just, just, and this, this will make sense, but just some ground rules. In the populations, in the pens of cattle you're going to look at, the white cattle are actually non-immune or naive. Um, susceptible. The red cattle are actually infected. So um, it doesn't make any difference with exactly what they're infected, but they're potentially shedding. So in the software, we can set the probability of them shedding at a level to make an effective contact. And the green cattle are the resolved the ones where the infection is resolved. And, and for this example, we're going to assume those are recovered and immune. So, and, and so let's jump into it. So there's your first pen of 100 cattle. Um, I set the probability that calves would have a 7% chance of being diseased when they get there. So but the way the computer model does it is he does, it does that actual individual probability calculation on each member of the population. I haven't counted these, but I told the computer I would like about seven out of 100 to show up as already breaking or at least incubating. We, we actually got eight, if I counted right. Uh, we got eight. So that's just a... A, a random prob difference in probabilities. And so because your magic glasses, you can see them, um, they might not be clinical yet. But if you think about how when you got an infected one touching a white one, um, there's potential for disease spread. And by day seven, actually the disease has spread in our model. Um, some of the cattle that were infected went through the probability algorithm and actually have recovered. So those are your green cattle. So at day seven, if you had these magic glasses and you went and looked at those cattle, that, that at least in, in, in my experience and the example I used for this, is that, that's what that, that population of cattle would look like. Um, pretty effective spread. The, the, the way the, the disease spreads in this model is that the, the, the algorithm will actually make those cattle move randomly about the pen. So they can randomly come in contact with pen mates, either reds or whites or greens. When they do come in contact, they go through that probability calculation. So at day 14, you can see that in this model, the, the <clears throat> the infectious agent has moved through, well, probably over half the population. I think, I think this is pretty intuitive to any of us who has received cattle. These cattle in particular, remember, they're, they're high-risk cattle. These aren't calves you're weaning on a ranch. These have been through a sale barn. 
And by day, day 21, you actually have the majority of your population either currently infected or recovered. In fact, you probably just, you probably got a couple handfuls of cattle that have been lucky enough in their life not to be exposed. So um, if you think about it, that up until day 14, disease was increasing and then somewhere between 14 and 21, we probably hit the peak of an epidemic and green calves won't get sick again and red calves can't get sick twice. So actually, you can actually think about that as maybe a lot of your risk. Your risk is associated with these white cattle. Those are your potential new cases. So I will actually go on another step to day 28. And we like, we feel a lot better when we get cattle out to, to about day 30, that first month. Um, but I think it's important to remember that, that there's still good probabilities, even at day 30, that there's still cattle that are naive in that population. Um, so I'm gonna back up and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you to think about What's the risk for, where does the risk exi exist for potential disease? And so red cattle are, have viruses, but that risk, risk has already happened. So what I want you to think about where the real, in a population where the risk really occurs is when there's red cattle and white cattle together. So if you think of red cattle as a fire, then the white cattle would be kindling for that fire and green cattle would be a fire extinguisher. So as, as we move through these days on feed, um, there are times where there's more red cattle, but there's not much kindling for, for that. So as we move on, um, day 35, and I'll stop at day 42, that really the, the this this disease is approaching endemic stability, right? That even though there are a couple naive cattle in here, there's a bunch of green cattle. So that as red cattle bump into green cattle, they can't transmit anymore. So if you live in a population where there are some red cattle, but if there's a bunch of green cattle, it's almost protective to you if you're still naive. And, and that actually makes a lot of sense um, um, when, when you think about how COVID spreads also. So, but I'm gonna go ahead and click through the days on feed because what I wanted to show you is that We've surpassed the magic day of 45. Somewhere, somebody decided that if you can get cattle started 45 days, they're in pretty good shape. And I will remind everybody that most of those um, assumptions were based on calves being weaned at a, at a ranch. So a weaned and bunk, weaned at a, at a ranch for 45 days is a lot different than um, high-risk cattle entering a starting yard. Because one thing we can do at a ranch is we can actually turn these cattle green with some vaccination strategies. Whereas we don't have as much option to do that in, in, the, um, in the stocker business. So, but I, what I wanted you to see at least how this model ran is there exists the possibility of naive animals for quite a while past 45 days. So if you notice here, we got one white calf that all the green cattle are pretty well pr protecting him. And because of the way I set up the probabilities for recovery, um, we, uh, we, we still have some cattle that are struggling to recover. In this particular model, um, we didn't actually get all the cattle to recover until day 77. And what's interesting about this software is because there's random functions in the calculations, these models never run exactly the, the same way twice, just like cattle 
health in a pen of cattle never happened exactly the same way twice. So I tried to pick an example that I thought was pretty representative that the received high risk group of calves, it took 77 days for the disease to kind of run its course. But I wanted to take you a little farther because in Missouri, this is kind of where our world stops, you know, um, but a lot of you guys practice in feed yards and you guys have opportunity that as the weeks pass that you actually get to own these cattle and manage these cattle after they've reached endemic stability. So I took the example all the way out to 22 weeks on feed, which would be about 154. And it's kind of, I don't know why I made all these slides because it's intuitive that um, as far as that, that model that you, you, you had gotten past your risk. So what the point I'm trying to highlight is the disease dynamic as it relates to day and feed is a, is a powerful leverage point in a system, especially one that handles high-risk cattle. Um, and most feedlot guys say, well, we have to receive some cattle. They're all going to have to go through it. And that's not really what I'm talking about. What Really what I'm talking about is to develop rational strategies about how long it takes to populate pens and develop a rational strategy about where to pen new cattle. So this, this, is, this is a little bit of data uh, from my practice. And I noticed that we've already got a half hour gone, so I'll speed it up. Um, <clears throat> so this was a pen of about 240 heifers at a client of mine. Um, this is a little bit hard to read, so I'll try to try to put you through it. So um, during this time period, we were trying to build big pens of cattle because our feedlot buyers liked to buy big pens of cattle. So we were building pens of cattle that were about 250 head. This particular pen had about 240. Uh, so <clears throat> there were groups, each group was about 60 calves. So there was a group that entered the pen on May 10th, the morbidity on that group of cattle was about 18%. The next cattle entered that pen, the next 60 some head, I don't remember all the details, entered that pen roughly 14 days later uh, with the same receiving protocol. So <clears throat> those cattle, the first pull rate was about 20%. Cattle went in 19 days later, and the, that cohort of 60 cattle got pulled at a rate of over 30%. And the real place where we learned our lesson is the cattle that got put in that pen roughly three weeks after that pen had, had gotten started. Um, that, that, kit, that, pet, that cohort um, got pulled at a rate of over 80%. On the on this, all all four cohorts got the exact same protocol, and that was using a macrolide metaphylaxis. So this this was actually a trend that we were blind to, because we pulled a lot of cattle out out here anyway. Um, but we weren't aware that those cohorts entering lately, entering late in days on feed were at such high risk. And just to remind you, because I've given you these visual examples of what pens look like at day 21. So here's our model of what day 21 looks like. And I think, I hope it's starting to become intuitive that you would not want to put white cattle into that pen, right? So white cow, white or non-immune naive cattle would only serve as a source of fuel for the fire. So we, we, we learned these lessons about here and <clears throat> that's when we started developing these strategies to use um, penning strategies to biocontain pathogens. So, you know, the first idea is where, is where you pen them, right? So when you get new cattle, where do you want to pen them? And, le and let's say 
we have a very small yard. They just have six six pens of cattle, and they there there's another pen that needs to be placed somewhere. And I'll give you options. In fact, I'm going to make it simpler. I'm going to I'm going to ask you <clears throat> if you could pen them in one pen one or pen two. Either next cattle that were that they just came in with, or next cattle that have been there 21 days, where would you where would it where would it seem rational to pen them? And I hope it 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 kind of makes sense that it might make more sense to put them in one, because if they're in pen one, they got all the disease risk probability they came in with, plus they're exposed to one, two, three, what seven or eight other infected ones across the fence. But if you pen them over here, they, they have the probability they came in with plus about 60 or 70 infected cattle. So I hope it makes sense that it might make to pen them in one, not two. So, but the world's not a simple place and, and often you're, you have more choices. So now um, think about where you would wanna pen them now. Um, so you have some decisions. So to me, it's between one and three. So if you pen them in one, they're next to a few infected cattle, but that's true for pen three. But if you pen them next to one, they're next to a bunch of naive cattle. And then if, but if you pen them in three, they're next to a bunch of green cattle. So I've been trying to hint that green cattle should act I mean, they exist as a biocontainment firewall. So, um, Brian, Dr. Vanderlei, would you like to unmute and tell me where you'd like to pen these cattle? I'd put them in pen three. Pen three seems to be rational, but I, uh, and, and, and I, that is the point I wanted to make with this slide, but after considering it more, I'll advance the slide. And I'll point out that I never told you you couldn't move cattle. So, and, and my guys do it in Missouri, and I'm sure you, a lot of the people you guys work with, they get reluctant to move cattle. Um, so really, although three was a correct answer, maybe a more correct answer was to move the 21-day cattle next to 56, thereby giving you a better place for your other pen and move. So kind of a trick question, Brian, sorry to do that to you, but um, you can handle it. So the idea uh, is that you can manipulate where pens are based on days, day of feed, days on feed to mitigate the risk of incoming cattle. But we don't always start with empty yards, do we? So you, we gotta start thinking about as populations turn in a facility, and this example will be the starting yard. So my type of system that I'm used to working with. So how, we, how can we kind of use this modeling to assess the health risk that's in, in, inherent to that facility? And if you're thinking that way, I hope some of you are thinking, now I want you to substitute the word system for, for facility. So what yard level risk is inherent to that system? So what I did is I, I made a small yard of 10 pins and then I used the random function in Excel to determine how many days on feed each pen was. Um, so in a starting yard, that's zero to seven weeks on feed. And we'll do a feed yard example where it's zero to 22 days on feed, uh, just because I think it illustrates a point. But and I've mentioned this, <clears throat> that this all kind of works when you start with an empty yard and we've all worked with yards as they fill up. That there's actually a little bit of good health magic that happens as you populate facilities. <clears throat> but that, that magic, that good health you have when the yard isn't completely full seems to go away um, after the, the yard population has turned a couple times. And I'll show you. So I ask Excel to determine which, how many days on feed each one of those 10 pins were. And so, so that, that's, that's the scenario we see. 
We see varying shades of green and red and white. Some pens we, we kind of got a critical view of now that especially if they have red and green cattle together, we have pens that are mostly green that we maybe feel a little bit better about. And I think the point here is that the, the way we build our systems, even if you know how to pen cattle correctly, that once, once a system reaches a certain point, it becomes almost impossible to use that strategy. So you probably have enough tools um, to think about. Maybe if I rearrange those pins, I could mitigate a little risk. Like maybe I want uh, this zero and seven together. Maybe it's not the best. Maybe I can swap out this 42 for the seven and mitigate a lot a little bit of that risk. And <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, that's exactly what we do on our operations that handle high risk cattle. We will move cattle to, to mitigate that risk. So I did, I did three iterations of this little yard just to show you that over time and the randomness of, in the system that you, you will actually um, have more and more difficulty finding um, places to pen cattle where it makes biocontainment risk in these starting yards. And there's your third iteration. But I want you to think about one more thing and I'll back up and let you see the other iterations. So let's look at the, here's our first one. So I want you to think about of those 10 pens of cattle, which is the healthiest pen of cattle? Which pen of cattle has the least diseased cattle in it? And you don't have to count red cattle very long before you realize that the healthiest cattle that are in this yard are the ones that just got off in the truck and walked into this pen on the end here. So what happens in these starting yard populations is even though we buy high-risk cattle, because of the disease dynamic that happens in these starting yards, they're the healthiest cattle in the population. So what you got to do, we're all trained to quarantine populations. They trained us how to do that in vet school. But what you got to do with high risk starting yards is you've got to reverse quarantine. Instead of protecting the population from the incoming cattle, you protect the incoming cattle from the population. So kind of fundamentally different disease dynamic than you see in, in feed yards. And I think explains why stocker operations often um, will empty out and restart. And, um, we actually have worked with some, some stocker operations to where we can actually build in an empty pen to rotate through the, through the penning strategy so we can take advantage of this biocontainment. So that's what uh, those classes I gave you, that's what um, starting yard looks like. I'll work through the feed yard a little bit quicker because those cattle are there longer. I think it should make sense to all of you that because the cattle are on feed so much longer <clears throat> that a smaller percentage of the pens will have red cattle in them. In fact, the majority of the pens of cattle are gonna be no risk at all. Um, as we go through these iterations, I hope you gain appreciation how you could move some pens of cattle around to use pens of immune cattle as uh, biocontainment firewalls. Um, and the, the, the reason I say this is that as I work with producers, what I find them wanting to do is to start at one end of a row of pens and fill them up in order because that makes sense for the feed truck and the doctrine crews and everything else, <clears throat> which I understand. But um, there's, there's an unintended consequence to that that unintended consequence is that you 
bio magnify pathogens down the row um, as you populate pens. So if you think about filling a row of pens every week, add a pen or two pens, um, what's going to happen is you will consist consistently over time put white cattle next to red cattle. And um, I've never, I haven't been able, able in my practice to overcome that penning, penning strategy with any tool as I, that I have. Not antibiotics, not vaccine. That penning strategy with high-risk cattle is fatal. It, will, it, will, it won't work. Or I haven't been able to work with it. So real quickly, because we're 45 minutes into this, let's look at another powerful point of leverage in, in biocontainment. So let's, let's look strictly at population size. Um, in, in this exercise, we're gonna buy 2,000 2, head of stalker calves. Um, so let's imagine we're in Nebraska at a feed yard and we have pens that hold, hold 200 head apiece. So we pen them in two loads per pen. Now, I've changed the probabilities on this model, and what I tried to model is the probability of a calf showing up being a disease carrier, and I used PI for my model because we know a lot about the probability of a calf being PI. I told the model that there was a 0.4% chance that a calf could be a PI. So the model did 2,000 individual probability calculations, and that probability um, is represented if, if you got unlucky, you, you are identified here as a red calf in these pens of cattle. And I know this, these are kind of hard to see, but I'll, I'll help. So I, I identified the calves that by random probability turned up to be PIs, and I'll identify which pens they're in. And we know PIs and big pens of cattle are, are not good for health. <clears throat> and just, just for this exercise, it doesn't have to be PI. It can be multi-drug resistant manheimia. It could be uh, histophilus. So it could be one of a bunch of different kinds of pathogens or carrier states. Um, it was just easy to use PI because of the probability. So. We know that the calves and th that those pens are a little bit at disadvantage, and actually, we know that calves in fence, fence line contact with those PIs are, are actually at a little bit compromised uh, risk. So um, I don't know. We had so we had two thousand calves, and we had one, two, three, four, five, six. We had seven PIs show up. That's, that's one less than we would have predicted with our probability, but that's just the way it worked out. That's where they turned up. Um, we ended up with, with one pen that's not, doesn't have a PI and it's not next to a PI. So actually we have one pen that's in good shape. So I'll recap those stats real quick. In our, two, our two, 200 head pens, about 2,000 head got seven PI. We had 1,200 cattle that were pen mates with PI. 1,800 cattle were exposed to PI either in the pen or across the fence. And we, we actually had 200 cattle that weren't exposed. So you know where I'm going. Let's put a load per pen, 100 calves per pen. And I apologize a little bit here because the way I scrunched up my pictures, it's hard to tell those are even cattle, but I'll show you their little cattle and we did the same probability calculations. So there's little red cattle in that, in that 2,000 head. So uh, 20 pens of 100 each. I'll help you out and show you where the PI showed up. Um, and just in real life, <laughs> you think you see them in clusters because we got a couple of pens with two pens each or two head each that are PI, but really all it is is, is, is the randomness of probability calculations. I'll identify your fence line contact pins, and I'll identify your cattle that are in good shape. And if you're like most people I know <clears throat> that work with cattle, you, you tend to count the pens that are in good shape. So 
I'll summarize real quick when we decided to pin them in pens of 100. We still had 2,000 head. Uh, this time, by luck, we actually had more PIs. We had nine PIs and seven pens. So 700 were pen mates with PIs. 1,200 were exposed to PIs either in the pen or across the fence. 800, 800 of them weren't exposed at all. So we actually, if you think about it, just by our penning strategy, we, we kind of protected a bigger segment of the population. But I'll tell you what we do in Missouri is if we buy a load, we will actually split it into two pens. So let's do that. So each load fills two pens. So now we're down to 50 head per pen. Uh, didn't change any of the probabilities on the PI. Um, so they still showed up randomly based on those calculations. And I'll highlight them for you. Still, it's still probably pretty long odds that two would show up, but it did occur twice in a couple pins. So uh, that's where the PIs in that 2000 head are. And the pins that affect them, there's your fence line pins. But then now let's look at all the pens that we protected just by that pinning strategy. So um, I'll go through my animation just because I know you guys like to count that as that happens. But what happened is we actually protected 23 pens of cattle um, just, just not by changing any disease probabilities, but just by changing the size of our pen. So I'll summarize in the 50 head pens. We had 2,000 heads, same. We also had nine PI, so actually one more than our probability model would have predicted. Um, 350 head were pen mates with PI, 850 exposed either in the pen or across the fence, and over half the population actually now protected. So summarize that quickly in a graph. The blue line is the individual probability for each calf. And I told you I set that up 0.4%. And I gave you three, three scenarios, either 200 head pens, 100 head pens, or 50 head pens. And by changing nothing but the size of the pen, I could dramatically protect or expose proportions of the population. So as as pen size decreased, my probability of non-exposure increased, right? And as my pen size increased, my probability of exposure increased. So that, that actually is just a little bit of, of math and something we don't talk to our clients a lot about. But if you work in my part of the world, you do talk to them about it because you have to, because that's that's you literally will struggle to manage health without managing this aspect. So uh, quickly, Brian, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the systems thinking um, behind this that fixes the backfire are kind of what has defined my career as a veterinarian because as a stalker vet, I was asked to manage increased BRD risk. And I did that by metaphylaxis. So as risk increased, I applied more metaphylaxis. By applying metaphylaxis, I actually, that was actually an effective strategy that worked. Um, and it, it helped me decrease and manage the BRD risk. But actually something else happened unintended to me is that by using metaphylaxis over time, the systems I work with increase the number of cattle they purchased because of um, the de decreased disease risk. As they increase the amount of cattle they purchased, disease ri risk went up. So even though I could in the short term help with metaphylaxis, what happened is they increased population size over the long term, and we ended up right back where I was. So that really didn't bother me in the late 90s and 2000s because if we have practitioners in the audience, a lot of you lived this with me because in 95, this was 
my cattail, right? And I was perfectly happy to live in my circle. A few years later, after my cattail wasn't working as good, we used Exceed, and I lived up here. And then we went to a Florin Fenicol or a Macrolide. So my practice career has really been defined in the stock industry as, as applying metaphylaxis in a way that allowed production systems to go very big to a level where they, they still have the risk. Um, so just some points that I wanted to share that balance and diligence are required in managing the short-term and long-term health expectations so that they, they don't become mutually ex exclusive. And what I mean by that is high-risk calves man managed with the sole goal of minimizing BRD morbidity and mortality during the first, first 60 days can sometimes have difficulty and delays in addressing the needs to strengthen long-term immunity. And I'm actually going to back up a little bit here because I, a question I get often is delayed vaccination. Um, so I'd like to back up to my... So delayed vaccination can kind of be a systems level question. Um, and come on, computer. Let me jump out of this real quick and show you our stalker yards. Okay, there's our stalker yard again. Um, so if you think of one thing, and, and I actually, uh, I, I love to really read about vaccine at arrival strategies, and I think it's probably something that's getting ready to change dramatically in our profession but you need to think about it on a systems uh, perspective. So one of the things that scares me about delayed vaccination is if you take a, a set of pins that look like that and you delayed um, on arrival processing 30 days. So what I worry is it's gonna increase the proportion of the cattle that are white. So I don't know that if that's gonna happen or not. But at least from a systems viewpoint, we only use delayed vaccinations if we can get um, small yards to go all in, all out. Um, in that aspect, I think there's a ton of potential that actually delayed vaccination and a strategy like this really scares me. Um, and I think a good example is that you need to interpret things um, at a systems level. So let me get back to my slideshow here. So something just to share. So let's start in the middle of this diagram with health risks. So this is where veterinarians work. So clients call me to, to man help manage their health risks. So often what I do is I will move and I will go visit their operation, look at what's going on and assign a, a strategy to manage their health risk, right? So I recommend metaphylaxis. And that actually alleviates the health risk. So I got a nice little loop going here to where I can kind of help them along with short-term strategies. But I've practiced 28 years now, and I know there are more fundamental things in the system I need to address, like immune status, penning strategies, feed nutrition. <clears throat> and so I also know that I need to be working down here in a long-term strategy to make fundamental, to address the fundamental causes, right? The disease dynamic, um, the immunity status. The problem is, is that these take a long time to accomplish. And veterinarians get real focused at short-term strategies to fix problems. And in fact, a lot of the veterinarians that are, are, seem to be most successful are best at doing these short-term strategies. But 
the thing to be aware of is that often when you get good at doing short-term strategies, you don't allocate the time and effort to work at the long-term strategy. So this is my shot across the bow warning that if you are very good at designing metaphylactic protocols and treatment protocols, that's all very good. But if you're not working fundamentally to address some of the fundamental causes, eventually the system will catch up with you. So that is a shifting the burden. <clears throat> I just wanted to share with you real quickly that as you if I inspire any of you to learn systems thinking, that you can, it's really fun to use these modeling and causal loop diagrams. If you think deeply and fundamentally about issues, this one happens to be uh, a systems diagram of how Robin Faulkner, Dr. Faulkner, views BRD and high risk calves. And this one is how I view uh, BRD risk. Um, so what system thinks system thinking has allowed me to do is it's a tool for me to think outside the box about risk inherent to the system, not just the animal. And Brian, it's exactly 1.30 and that's all I have. So thank you all for listening. And I do have time if there's questions.